but it is a couple minutes past the hour, so I'd say let's get started. Let's do it. I have not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. Yes, we can appreciate Thomas Edison's tenacity, but an inventor's failures are different than failures in packaging and cold chain. Lives may be on the line. Those cultures, lab results, chemicals, and even organs need to arrive safely from physical and thermal shocks. What happens when packages fail? How can we keep our shipments within a certain temperature range? And isn't testing expensive? In this webinar, we will unpack these themes as we delve into a case study. Welcome to our webinar, Cold Chain Demystified, a reliable approach to packaging and testing. First, let's meet the speakers. Hi, my name is Laura Shemansky. I started at Polar Tech about five years ago in the reception field, and I contributed my graphic design knowledge. And, and over time, I grew this position of sales, design, and marketing. So I just entered that this January, and it's been a wonderful experience. Um, Alan, would you like to say a couple of words about yourself? Certainly. Thank you, Laura. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you for joining us today. As just mentioned, my name is Alan Cole. I've been with Polar Tech for nine years now. During my time here, I've been lucky enough to work with a broad base of our clients, food manufacturers, distributors, science customers, and even some of our government agencies and government contracts. So I'm very excited to speak with you more today on our topic of demystifying cold chain shipments. Hey everyone. I'm Melissa Kriegel. I am the sales manager here at Polar Tech. I've got over a decade of packaging experience to share with you all, so I'm thrilled you've joined us today. Thank you so much. Let's introduce Polar Tech to you if you're not familiar. We have been in business since 1984. Government agencies actually use our products for vaccines and other medical purposes. For example, the state health departments and the Department of Defense. We have a wide selection of materials that will help you on your way towards your shipping journey. So for example, we have foam insulated containers and cold packs. Those are our bread and butter. We manufacture those in the USA. We make dry ice makers. We provide labels and uh, temperature indicators, for example, that, that also help. And our quality, we stand behind. Our foam insulated containers are 20% more dense than our competitors, meaning they won't fall apart during transit. And you could trust that, that your product will arrive within a certain temperature. On top of that, we have an affordable testing program that we want to delve into a little bit here. But first, I would like to have Melissa talk a little bit about our customer base. Gladly. When you choose Polar Tech, you inherit a team of knowledgeable and friendly people whose number one goal is to support you. That means friendly, personable service every time. This service is exemplified through our repeat business. We're not even halfway through the year yet, and 90% of our customers who ordered last year have already ordered this year. It's not too surprising, though, considering Polar Tech offers the largest selection of insulated containers and cold packs on the market. This means that if you place an order with us and something happens to be on back order, our team will go above and beyond to find an alternate item to best support you and your company's needs. I'm very proud to say that since the start of the pandemic in 2020, Polar Tech has only extended their lead times once. Considering we can all likely relate to the whirlwind that was and is COVID-19, we will likely agree that this sort of accomplishment is definitely something to boast about. Polar Tech's lead time is half the timeline you can expect elsewhere. All in-stock items ship within just four business days. That means no waiting eight plus weeks for product you desperately need to run your business. We understand the importance of follow through, communication, and as a result, we do not hesitate to pick up the phone. We pride ourselves on our consistency and our dependability. 
We service many different types of customers, but today we'll dive into a little bit more specifics regarding our science customer basis. Next. So more into Polar Tech and its customer base, specifically the science applications. Here you'll see an example of the variety of science based customers that we've helped throughout the years. As you can see, there is an array of different companies and even organizations. Ones I've always found most interesting and unique are some of the specialty drug clients, the organ procurement networks, and our infectious substances. Now, organ procurement specifically is near and dear to me. Several years ago, a friend of mine needed a kidney transplant. And, you know, during this very stressful period of time, it really hit home and made me appreciate my job a bit more. The organizations, networks, companies that we help make a huge difference in someone's life and can even save someone's life. Yeah, absolutely. I too have been impacted through Polar Tech's packaging in ways I never thought. Um, typically, I was using our cold packs for personal lunches um, until my late dog was diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, I actually um, had to carry around, you know, coolers and ice packs to maintain the uh, temperature okay for that drug to survive. And man, does that change everything when you are trying to go on vacation or a small road trip? Luckily, Polar Tech has these tiny little cute containers and cold packs that it was really simple to carry along with. It does matter to us personally and professionally that your shipments arrive safe. Let's take a look into our testing capabilities that makes this possible. On to some of our testing and our lab capabilities. So this will give you a little idea of what needs we can manage should you ever find yourself in a position of needing to pre-qualify your packaging. So first up, a fun fact about our core Polar Tech team, which you would deal with during any testing process. That would include some of our sales reps, inside sales, of course, managers, engineers, and lab technicians. So the cumulative years of experience during that amongst that core team is north of 164 years. So it, it's you can count on lots of experience and previous case study knowledge that we can apply towards your specific needs. On to some of the pictures here. On the bottom left hand corner, you'll see an example of some of our larger chambers. And to mention they, they are some of the biggest in the industry. These are very nice because we can fit full pallet simulations if needed. The freezers and refrigerators that you'll see in the top right hand corner. These are very important to use to precondition some of the products we would be testing, payloads, and also the refrigerants that we would use in the test. Underneath that, you'll see an example on some of our smaller chambers. The smaller blue chambers are very popular for running standard size insulated packages as well as EPS containers. We have seen a sneak peek of our lab testing equipment. Let's see what it could do for you. Let's introduce our featured case study. OK, so throughout this presentation, we will be covering and you know referencing back to a case study. This specific case study takes a real life situation. One of our customers had experienced in the past until they had come to us for some testing. There were two main specific issues at hand. They were experiencing failed packages during summer months. And the other issue at hand was the total expenses allocated towards sending their products out. You know, of course, both of those issues were leading to unwanted additional expenses, especially the compromised shipments that were experiencing excursions outside of the acceptable temperature profile. So the end goal here with this client was to design a configuration keeping a two to eight degree Celsius profile for a maximum of two days, 48 hours. Before we get into the actual testing phases and preparation we take, let's get into the circumstances of why a package might fail in the first place. Yes, let's define the dreaded reality of packaging failure. Packaging failure occurs when a payload is compromised 
due to a temperature excursion, physical damage from drops or other physical damages, or a lack of instructions or communication. So if a package isn't labeled that it needs to stay refrigerated or frozen, how is the end user supposed to, to handle that package? Packaging failure can also happen due to packaging waste from not using the right materials, using oversized materials, using profiles that are not meant for that particular season, or using poor quality materials, as if you weren't using any materials at all. Proper packaging allows for less waste of your product, less waste of packaging materials, and less waste in freight. Let's demystify another topic and break down what happens during the testing process. So demystifying the process of testing, which let's admit can be very complicated at times. Here at Polar Tech, we like to break the process down into three main phases. Phase one, which is the most important, that would involve setting expectations. So i.e. what product products are we dealing with? What are your current challenges with this product? And what are your goals when shipping this product? During this phase, you'll work alongside with a sales rep and also a lab technician to evaluate your specific project requirements. All of this information, it's going to come from a detailed questionnaire form that we provide. After this is completed, our lab tech will tailor a testing program to fit your exact needs. So about the questionnaire form, what does it exactly entail? Melissa is going to go into that. Well, to start, Polar Tech has received various types of testing requests related to package transit simulation like drop tests, where we've tested against specific protocols defined by different organizations such as ASTM or ISTA. So whether you have specific instructions or protocols for our lab to follow, or you need us to qualify your package as is, we've got you covered. Ultimately, it's all in the details, friends. The more we have from you, the better prepared will be. For that reason, our questionnaire is designed to cover a lot of ground so we can be as thorough as possible. For example, we'll want to know what kind of packaging you're currently using. Does it compare to the quality insulation that Polartex containers would provide? Does the package have to go through a rigorous customs clearance or does it typically sit idle somewhere else for a long duration of time? These are details that we won't know about your package, but you will, especially with the way the freight industry is these days, we can likely expect some sort of delay. And it could be something as simple as a package sitting on someone's front porch for hours in direct sunlight, or even at a terminal on a hot tarmac, for example. Either way, arguably the most important detail that we'll collect from you has got to be about your product, right? Because without it, there isn't a package to send. For this reason, we need to know as much as possible. Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? Is it hazardous? What type of conditions is it most sensitive to? The list goes on. All in all, accurate details are very vital and necessary for achieving successful test results. And with these details, we can arm against packaging failure due to temperature excursions. That was one of the goals of our case study. But how exactly do we maintain temperature? Alan will explain. So what is a common theme amongst cold chain shipping? I think we can all agree the number one common goal and common theme is maintaining temperature. So back to why one of the reasons why phase one is so important, setting the expectations and going through that questionnaire with your lab technician and sales rep is so important. All of those answers are going to be taken into consideration to navigate the bullet points shown here. So bullet point one, weight ratio of product to refrigerant. Going back to our case study, that specific case study ended up being successful using 1.5 pounds of refrigerant to every one pound of product. Bullet point two, wall thickness, or insulation power, R value of your insulated material. 
The case study, we had used an inch and a half wall thickness, which is one of our recommended sizes for two and three day shipping. Bullet point three, eliminating air gaps. Void space, you know, cold chain 101, void space is not your friend. Some other points in important to mention and talk on, they aren't listed here as bullet points, but they are pack out environment and atmosphere, preconditioning of not only the product itself, but your refrigerants and duration of preconditioning. So during a case study, we did pack out in an ambient lab setting, but what is important is the preconditioning of both the payload bottles being tested and the refrigerants used. The bottles in this case study were conditioned at six degrees Celsius, 42 Fahrenheit, for no less than 24 hours, and the refrigerants used were conditioned at negative 23 Celsius, negative 10 Fahrenheit for no less than 24 hours. So this was important to reiterate to the client and let them know that prepping and preconditioning the bottles and of course, freezing the refrigerants before sending out is very important. Not to sound like a broken record, but you know, again, details, to dive in and get all of those bullet points correct, we must get the details from you from our questionnaire. So it all boils down to details as Melissa had stated. I want to do a quick poll to review. What helps to maintain temperature? Is it A, a snug fit? B, choosing correct thickness of insulation? C, using proper ratio of refrigerant to product? Or D, all of the above? So feel free to use our chat and type in a letter that you think is correct. The answer is coming in. Oh yes, it's a resounding D, all of the above. Yes, thank you so much. A plus is across the board. Across the board. So back to testing, demystified. We're going to go into phase two, which consists of measuring characteristics. So this phase, I always joke around, uh, this is probably the phase that our engineers look forward to the most, right? They get to quote unquote nerd out in our labs. So this phase consists of simulating the actual environment and measuring the effects and the interactions on the packaging the refrigerants, and also the product being tested. This will be done in one of the heat chambers shown previously. And again, there are a couple chambers available depending on the actual size of the insulated container we may recommend and how many footprints or tests you need simulated. So the neat thing about the chambers, we can set them to simulate any temperature profile. So i.e. winter, summer profiles, or even a specific temperature that you know your product is going to be exposed to throughout your supply chain. Speaking of simulating an environment, we actually have a demo video to show you of a drop test. All right, so this is packaging out a couple of small vials that are glass and we are trying to do a pack out that will keep it temperature uh, within a certain range and then also keep it safe from this drop, um, this drop that we're going to, to make it go through. It's a four foot drop. So we are placing bets as to whether or not this will work. Over yeah, under I on think them, it will work. Over under on them breaking. They're, they're small vials. I'm, I'm gonna be devil's advocate. Not sure if it's gonna, gonna hold through the drop. I think it will. Yeah, I mean, look it'll survive. That, that insulation is an, a, an inch and a half thick. We're, we're using wadding to uh, absorb any condensation. We have refreezer bricks, which are foam. I think these are going to be fine. Um, we also try to surround it on as many sides as possible with refrigerant so that during transit, it can be uh, kept cold. We are filling up those empty air spaces because air gaps are not our friend. Put that lid on. The last last chance. What do you think? Is it going to survive the drop? 
It'll be good. I can have faith. <laughs> you know my answer. <laughs> right, here's the drop. Oh, it landed on a corner on the edge. That, that was right on the corner. So it doesn't even look like it fell. You can tell it's the same package once you open it, though. Well, the proof is in the pudding here. <laughs> <laughs> I vote 10 feet next time. Yeah. We can do higher than four feet. Yes. Good point. All right, taking out our refreezer bricks. Drum roll. Oh, ah. and it's unharmed. Look at that. That's okay. I'll be wrong. I'm glad I didn't put any money down. <laughs> okay. Do you have a question? <laughs> what is a typical drop height? So that that specifically, the four foot, was run as a typical drop height from someone carrying. So the the end user, or excuse me, the the carrier itself, you know, small parcel, assuming that someone carrying the package to deliver it, that was the average height. Okay, on to testing demystified the final third stage. This is the stage that our customers and potentially you get to really look forward to. It consists of documenting the results. So what does that entail? A comprehensive test report, all formal test methods that were recorded, including shipping components. And the nice thing, we do also include charts, graphs, photographs, and some spreadsheets. The graphs are really nice for anyone that has accreditation or regulatory purposes. They can file those. The photographs work great, and a lot of our customers after the test will use them to formally train their warehouse, and that's a big part of then maintaining that quality control on all shipments going forward. Speaking of graphs, why don't we go ahead and take a look at the case study, the results and corresponding data. All right, so I see we've got the graph up here. So what's going to happen? Let me point out that these two bold red lines, they indicate the goal temperature window. So that top red line being the maximum of eight degrees Celsius, the bottom red line being our minimum window, which was two degrees Celsius. Another important part to point out is the blue line indicating the temperature of the bottles. So you may be wondering, you know, Alan, why did the temperature, why did it dip and drop so much during, during that first four hour period? And that's, that's actually a very important part of the test and of using refrigerants. So what happens there? The energy transfer of our refrigerants, because if you remember, they were preconditioned a lot cooler than the bottles themselves. The energy transfer of the refrigerants help maintain the cool on the payload bottles. So then as you would see, for the next roughly 30 hours, we hold that perfect temperature minimum of two degrees Celsius. After about 30, 32 hours, the temperature does start to climb. But as you'll see, if you look on the right-hand side of the chart, after the maximum elapsed hours of 48, the bottles didn't quite get eight degrees Celsius. If we would zoom in, it was about seven degrees Celsius. So what was the conclusion and, and how did this customer actually use this data? So again, this was a new configuration that we had found for them. It was successful and able to maintain the two to eight degrees Celsius for the customer's max term of 48 hours. So this was a one-time lab fee to give them peace of mind and to fix all future shipments. We also ended up on a footprint of 11 bottles. As opposed to their previous shipments, they were only sending out two to four bottles. So this was a great way for them to optimize on their outbound packages, and it resulted in a large reduction on their shipping costs. I say we have another poll. 
what can you expect after Polar Tech conducts a test? A, picture references for your warehouse team. B, graphs detailing testing data. C, the option to validate results. Or D, all of the above. Any other answers? Looking like D's across the board. Looking like D's across the board. <laughs> that is correct. The answer is D. You didn't expect a second poll, did you? <laughs> <laughs> what is the most important part of the testing procedure to Polar Tech? Is it A, the results? B, your lab technician? C, the details provided to Polar Tech? Or D, the expense? Most important part, according to us. And yes, yes, the answer is C, the details. Thank you for paying close attention. Thank We've you. We've got a smart group of participants today. I'm happy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so your next thought might be, all right guys, I follow, but how much is this actually gonna cost me? Isn't testing expensive? <laughs> Not necessarily. Polar Tech offers affordable testing services to benefit your company's shipments and your bottom line. Currently, there are pre-validated shipping kits out on the market available to you. However, they can be extremely costly, especially if that package fails. In fact, many times our testing services begin because of a package failure, and it's not surprising that it does. These pre-validated solutions aren't designed with your specific product in mind, so it makes sense that the payload might be too large or too big in some instances. And then on top of that, if you experience a temperature breach but paid hundreds of dollars expecting the opposite, no one wants to be in that situation. So because Polar Tech is the manufacturer, we not only offer testing solutions, but also the items used in those solutions at a discounted price by volume. This means you get to enjoy a high return on investment from our detailed testing procedures. In fact, all that in mind, one could very easily argue that the cost of not testing is actually greater. I agree with that. The cost Absolutely. of not testing is greater due to replacements and return packages. Some companies seek an easy solution like pre-validated kits, but what they don't realize is that their kit needs to be pre-qualified to their specific application. We have reached our fourth and final point to demystify, pre-qualifying versus validating. Melissa? When you choose to partner with Polar Tech, you can expect integrity. Polar Tech will pre-qualify your solution, but we don't validate the data in-house because we find that this could be a conflict of interest. Like any good impartial study, a series of checks and balances needs to exist. For this reason, we set you up for success with our quality materials and accurate testing data, but we do offer a third-party validation with a partnered laboratory for your peace of mind. We've come to the slide, what's in it for me? So together in this webinar, we have introduced you to Polar Tech's testing procedures and demystified packaging failure, maintaining temperature, the expense of testing, and the differences between pre-qualifying and validating. Let's not stop there. We want to solve your particular shipping challenges. With our expert help and quality materials, we can give you the peace of mind that your company needs and deserves. So what is next? Do you, do you have any needs? Do you need to move forward? We are at your disposal. If you're an existing customer, please do reach out to your current sales representative. If you are a new customer or you have not yet dealt with Polar Tech, feel free to reach out to myself. I can be contacted via my email shown here on this PowerPoint. I can also be reached on my direct office extension listed here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for Cold Chain Demystified, a reliable approach to packaging and testing. 
We hope you found it informative and helpful and maybe a little bit fun. We now will begin our 10 minute Q&A session. If you have any questions, fire away. That's what we're here for. So go ahead and yes. use the, the chat function and we'll answer your questions. Are you capable of using dry ice in a test? Yes, absolutely. We handle dry ice all the time. Um, it, we usually will, uh, you know, come at it for, with a different strategy depending on what your application is and how sensitive your item might be to temperature. But our, our containers are rated to be used with dry ice. Absolutely. And we actually do have some dry ice uh, making equipment that we offer and sell. So we, we do have experience testing with dry ice. And also a, a popular method, which we like to deem combination method, in which past studies have incorporated not only dry ice, but also a mix of refrigerant cold packs as well. If you use dry ice, there is a resource page on our website, polar-tech.com, and uh, it's, it's dry dash ice. We have tons of helpful information. Um, it is a dangerous substance, so we want to make sure everyone is safe when using it. Absolutely. Next, we have a question. How much does testing cost for temperature excursion? It's a great question. Melissa, do you want to handle that? Yeah, absolutely. Our test it's, it's a little bit of a tricky question to answer, um, but I can give you a range based on the case studies we've had previously. Um, typically, when we use a, a test chamber, uh, it can range from 2500 or more per test, um, but that is a rough estimate and it is only the pre qualified version. So uh, that data is something that we would hand off to you, but if you wanted it to get to be validated by a third party, we could also take that additional step, um, in which case it would just double that price. Another question we have is, do you have super cooling in your boxes with dry ice? Super cooling. So, <clears throat> well, if we take the term super cooling and the use of dry ice, uh, I guess it definitely could be deemed as super cool. Um, you know, dry ice sits around negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we would compare that to even our case study that we covered, we had only preconditioned our refrigerants at negative 10 Fahrenheit. So negative 10 Fahrenheit, negative 109 degrees Fahrenheit. And dry ice is definitely a super cooling agent. Um, definitely don't want to use it if you don't want your product to freeze because it will freeze. And I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, if not, let us know for sure. How long does the test take from start to finish for a 48 hour is the summer? That's that's another great question. So the length of period for a test will depend on a couple of variations, one being how busy we are currently in our labs, you know, i.e. how many chambers are open. What also goes into effect is how many tests you may need done or how complicated your product or testing is. So the, the best way to get a, a good roundabout guesstimate is to speak with a sales rep and at least take the first step of getting through the questionnaire. Then we'll be able to give you a, a better window of time. But as always, if you do have a specific deadline, we'll try our best to meet that. A follow up to the super cooling question was no. I mean, if you see temperature below negative 78.5 degrees Celsius with dry ice. Let's see. OK, it, if if we see that temperature range. I, I don't get what, what the question is then of. You know. Are you asking what we would do if if we would see that temperature range? And I'm or sorry, have I don't. Have we seen it? Oh, oh, or have we seen it? Okay, mm -hmm. what was the temperature again, Laura? Negative seventy-eight point five degrees Celsius. Negative seventy-eight five. Uh, I, personally, I've never seen it in any case studies that I've covered. That honestly would have to be something I could ask my lab technician and engineer if they've ever done anything that have reached a cooling point that low, 
feel free, please email me and I'd love to follow <laughs> up and, and get a more specific, accurate answer for you. Yeah, and also include any goals because I'm curious the context behind that question too. Absolutely. If this is a question for your specific needs, please do include a little bit more about your product, what you're looking mm -hmm. to do. And I can have a quick chat with our lab tech to get you some more information. We do have another question coming in. So These are good questions. Are, yeah, I'm happy that it's happening. <laughs> no one's shy. So while we're waiting for the questions to come in, I wanted to mention a testimonial from a happy customer. We appreciate your keeping production going during this very difficult time. It enabled us to ship to our customers without interruption during the warm weather. That was from a customer of ours named John in 2020 as the pandemic was beginning to rear its head and we just stayed steadfast to his business and to all of our customers. That was a tough year for sure. Even 2021 was challenging. Then Colleen, who has been a customer of ours for decades, mentioned that she, it crossed her mind once to look elsewhere, but because our reps are so thoughtful and detailed, she wants to stay with us and stay with our quality products. So that's exciting too. I love those testimonials. Always good when to people, hear. Yeah, when people take the time to give positive feedback, it's really great. In the chat, Someone said, if you're looking to prevent supercooling, dunnage and layered packaging may be used during the Polar Tech pre-qualification process. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good right. point. Barriers will help. Yes, that, that ties into the void space is our enemy in cold chain packaging. Another question. Do you offer any types of recyclable alternative materials to EPS? Okay. So I, I think we could take that question and split it into two. So EPS itself is technically recyclable. Um, it's not curbside recyclable, which let's be honest, that's what most people are looking for when they say recyclable. But we, we do have, we used to have a, a nice format um, sheet to show different locations across the US that accept EPS um, to recycle and reuse. If you're looking for something curbside or biodegradable, we do offer some liners that are derived from plant starches. They are actually water soluble. So that would be more along the needs if, if you were looking for something totally biodegradable. And we also have cold packs that are biodegradable as well. Both the gel and the poly break down after 18 months. And if they're exposed to UV light and at a certain temperature. Do we have any more questions? I do see someone typing. I do see a repeat question, which was how long does a test take from start to finish for a 48 hour is the summer? Okay. What do you think that one was a mistake? So yeah, that just to reiterate that that would depend on really what our lab techs are doing, um, how many chambers are open, the period of time, you know, if it's our busy season. So the best the best time is to to get to us go through Seems the questionnaire possible. with a sales rep and we can get you a better timeline. Yep, don't wait till the last minute, definitely yep. not. Do you have a skid quantity of two ounce vials on hand to test with or would I need to send it to you? Mm, that's a really good question. Normally when we do the pre-qualification, we want it to be as accurate as possible. Like I drilled home earlier, uh, we need 
to know more about your product so that way our solution is specific <clears throat> to your product. So if at all possible, we would prefer that you send in your own product or vials um, because vials can be packaged differently. It could be different materials and it'll definitely skew the results. I have a comment and a question in one. You mentioned your material was more dense than other standard options. How does it compare to Uline materials? Is it is your material better in other ways too? I'll answer part of it. Um, <laughs> Uline is a distributor and we do partner with them to offer our items, um, but it, you'd have to, I, I don't know exactly what item you are looking into, um, but if you gave us a Uline part number, we'd be able to see if that matches. Yeah, and, and generally speaking, the density absolutely comes into play, but again, generally speaking, if it's the same wall thickness we're comparing of a U-line container to ours, it should be very, very close in terms of performance. And the bead that we source is 100% virgin bead, so it's not ground down material from other EPS locations or types, rather. Um, it's all in-house, so if we, you know, created some coolers that had a defect we grind that down in house and we'll re remold refuse but otherwise our bead is 100 percent virgin great great point to mention melissa is there a density rating for eps coolers yes there is if if we if we get into polar tech specifically our coolers most of them i'd say 80 percent if not higher they're run at a 1.25 density. We do have a special series of science shippers that are ran, I believe it's around a 1.7 or 1.75 density. And we have in the past for customers that needed a higher density, we have worked with them, worked with our production managers to run specific machines for their tailored product at that higher density. Definitely try to work with you on details because we have the capability. Yep, you know, absolutely. You have another couple of questions coming in. Awesome. We will wrap it up shortly, just to so that we are mindful of your time. Um, I, I'm really happy that you have so many good comments to make and, and good questions. Okay. Is there a specific EPS shipper for dry ice versus using cold packs? No, there isn't. Um, our containers are rated to be used with both. Um, so there isn't a specific one. They're all made pretty identical. The only difference is the size. So it really boils down to what type of goals you have, what your application is, and how much room we need to accommodate for dry ice uh, depending on, you know, how long that package is going to be in transit for. And, a, and another point to add, of course, is is wall thickness as well. If we're looking to attempt at slowing the dry ice sublimation rate, we would want to use a thicker wall. Um, Polar Tech, we've, you know, we've got as small as three quarters of an inch all the way up to three inch wall thickness. So that would be something to con consider as well. Approximately how long does a custom EPS box size project take, like typical mm -hmm. project length? Great question. So it's it's been a while since I've got into a custom mold project because if it is a custom size EPS container, that would consist on bringing in um, specific molds for that size. Generally speaking, it's probably going to take a couple months. I'd say one to three months. Another huge factor that may affect that timeline is, of course, you know, shipping. Whether we would source molds within the U.S. or if we would ship um, source them internationally at sometimes a, a lower cost. You know, the of course the time of shipping and customs. So it will vary. And Autumn chimed in. Yet yeah, roughly, you know, two to three months is is accurate.
Uh, thanks for the thumbs up. Thanks, Chris. I think that just about wraps up the questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Alan and Melissa, I, I really enjoyed talking with you today. I, yes, I hope well, you enjoyed yourselves too. Very absolutely. Much. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you joining us. So yes. together we demystify the testing process and certain shipping challenges. If there's anything else that we can clarify or if you need assistance, reach out to us, um, take notes on this slide. We want to meet and exceed your expectations. So we hope you take care and have a, a good rest of your week. Thanks again. Enjoy everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye now.